Welcome back to my YouTube channel, everybody. My guest today is Alex Finley, a former CIA officer who served in Europe and West Africa. She's also an expert in Russia and Russian influence in the Western world. And today with Alex, we'll talk about the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the role of oligarchs and uh, of the Russian misinformation campaign on the West. Thanks for joining me today, Alex. Thanks for your time. Thank you for having me. A pleasure to be here. Would you like to introduce yourself a little bit better than I did to tell my viewers who you are, what your background is, and introduce yourself? Sure. Well, like you said, I, I was in the CIA in the Directorate of Operations, which means I was on the operational side of the agency out in the field uh, helping in terms of collection of intelligence. I served in West Africa and in Europe. And since leaving the agency, I have written three satirical novels um, all about the CIA, but also about uh, geopolitical issues. The first one, Victor in the Rubble, is about the global war on terror. The second one, Victor in the Jungle, is about a populist dictator in South America who teams up with narco traffickers. And the third one, which just came out uh, a couple of months ago, is called Victor in Trouble. And as you mentioned, that is a satire about Russian influence operations in the West. And, it, and it's also set in Italy. So, and it is set in Italy, correct. So I found it very interesting also because of this, because I identify a lot of things that you say with, uh, with the real world. Uh, let me start with uh, something more uh, current that is going on these days. So we are seeing now that Russia invaded Ukraine in February and they completely underrated Ukraine's reaction because they thought the war would have lasted a few days and they seem to be stuck and they haven't looked stock for like four months. How can Russian intelligence make such a big mistake? What happened there? I think there are a few different dynamics at play here. So I would say first off is that Putin himself probably was very much under the impression that his destabilization efforts had paid off. So he has been trying for years to split the West, to split NATO and the Western alliance and to buy influence with a number of European and American politicians. And so I do think that he thought that unity was not there and that the West would not be able to come together and actually put together a unified response, which would be effective in some kind of a way. I also think that the endemic corruption under his regime has led to their own weaknesses. So the military maybe looked very strong and mighty on paper, but as we're seeing, the rot goes from, you know, from, the, from the, the head of the fish all the way through. So the military, you know, from the top, it's corrupt. So everybody along the way is skimming off. So maybe on paper at the end, you have 20 tanks and a thousand rounds of ammunition, but in reality, you have only five tanks and five pieces of ammunition because everybody has been taking and selling things along the way. And my guess is within the intelligence services, some of that is going on as well. Nobody wants to be the bearer of bad news, particularly to somebody like Vladimir Putin. And so they go in and they give him a very rosy outlook is my guess. And what can be the outcome of this situation? Is it reasonable to think that Russia goes home with nothing in its hands? I think it's possible. I think the, the best possible outcome here is that internally in Russia, they recognize that this corrupt system under Putin is no longer serving anybody well. Up until this point, um, they knew that it was a corrupt system, but a lot of the people close around him with influence and power were were profiting from that corrupt system, but it was stable. So everybody was getting something good out of it. Now with sanctions, with Putin seemingly being led more by this desire to win, um, that corrupt stable system has now been destabilized. So a lot of the people who were supporting Putin and allowing him to stay in power are no longer getting any benefit out of that relationship. So I think one hope is that eventually those people come together and work to, to take Putin out in some form or other. I don't know what that looks like, uh, a palace coup or a, something else, I don't know. 
Um, but, and then there, there are, of course, then questions about what, what might replace him if that scenario came about. And that's very unclear as well. Uh, I think he might have a, a vacuum and um, some real collapse within Russia for a while. So I don't think short term there are any positive outcomes here. And long term, I don't see Russia being anything other than a pariah state as long as Putin is in power. Well, let me ask you a $1 million question here. Uh, how long do you think this is going to last? How long can Russia bear this? I think Russia can bear it for a very long time. They have a history of fighting wars of attrition. They have a huge population that their leaders over history have been ready to throw in as cannon fodder and just keep fighting and fighting and wearing down the enemy. So the question I think is going to be a, a test of wills. Uh, who, you know, who's ready to sort of stand it out longer and will the West stay unified and continue uh, giving Ukraine the weapons that they need um, and more than just weapons they need to sort of hold a stalemate, will the West step up and provide weapons that would actually give Ukraine an advantage? And I'm, I'm not sure that anybody, I don't think that we're seeing that yet. One thing you mentioned in your book, your latest one, is the disinformation campaign that Russia is doing to try to influence uh, the West. Would you like to tell us how this started and how it works? Sure. When I was researching uh, Victor in, the, in Trouble, which is the third book, it actually grew out of um, my writing about the Russian interference in the U.S. elections in 2016. So I was writing uh, a number of Article nonfiction articles about that, discussing sort of the national security implications of what Russia had done in interfering in the US elections. And one of the things that I found very frustrating was that in the United States, the public debate, the excuse me, the public debate very much centered around the politics of it. It was about the Republican Party or it was about Trump himself. And lost in that conversation was what Vladimir Putin was doing and what his overall objectives were. And what Putin wanted was never Trump specific and was never US specific. And so in fact, when you look elsewhere, um, particularly in Europe, you find a number of very similar Russian operations that were launched with the same objective to buy influence with politicians, to buy uh, propagandists, uh, vloggers, blo excuse me, bloggers, journalists, influencers of all kinds to help spread a certain narrative and to help uh, advance a Russian, a pro-Russian agenda. So I set out to start trying to highlight that and highlight those patterns. And so by showing that it was happening in other countries, I was hoping that we could remove the politics of it from the discussion in the US public debate. So actually one of the countries that I looked at was Italy. Um, Italy has this really actually uh, fantastic, uh, easily easy to digest example. Um, Italy has Matteo Salvini, who is the head of La Lega political party, a far right party. That had been a very uh, regional party for years until Salvini traveled to Moscow and lo and behold, some miracle, he returns from Moscow and is able to turn his regional party into a national party. And uh, then as the years go on, one of his top consigliere uh, meets in Moscow with a number of Russian businessmen and they discuss a gas deal between Russia and Italy and the money going uh, some money from that deal will be siphoned off. All of this is allegedly. Some of that money will be siphoned off and fed into the coffers of La Lega political party to help La Lega in upcoming European Parliament elections. And all of this is caught on tape. And so now you have a prosecutor in Italy who is investigating this and investigating uh, Gianluca Savoini, who was the one who was uh, uh, the consigliere to Matteo Salvini. So the Italy example to me was just e easy. I mean, the, the whole, uh, you know, this entire sort of corrupt scheme was put out there on tape for all of us to, to watch or to listen to. And uh, I said, okay, well, that's a really great example um, to use as the basis for Victor in Trouble. And so that was uh, sort of how I started the book. 
Well, since you mentioned it, I would like you to elaborate because uh, in your book, there's definitely a character which is inspired by Matteo Salvini. But in the real world, we also have, for instance, uh, the Movimento Cinque Stelle, which is another party who's not taking a very strong stand against Putin because they seem to be like they don't want to oppose Putin very much. How much is real uh, of that and how much is out of your fantasy? Well, what I tend to do with all of my writing is start with something that's real and then play with it um, and twist it and turn it in different ways to, to highlight some of the realities that I want to highlight. That's one of the reasons that I use satire. I find that satire actually makes very serious subjects um, more accessible, I think, to the general public. So, you know, I, in a lot of my nonfiction writing and articles that I was writing, trying to sort of scream out to the public why this is a national security issue, uh, people would say, well, you're being dramatic. This is, you're overstating it. What I found in writing satire is that I can show sort of step by step how these operations work. And that's what I do in Victor in Trouble. So you see step by step. Uh, the source that's being recruited by Russian intelligence, why Russian intelligence is going after him, what they're expecting him to do, how they treat him, um, and, and what other operations they have going on to sort of create this, this grander strategy uh, to achieve their objectives. Well, one other thing you talk about is uh, conspiracy theories that were spread by the Kremlin to, I don't know, to spread anger in the Western world, something of the sort. Would you like to to, to describe how it works and how you describe it in your book. Yeah, one of the things that we see in that I that I put in the book actually is based a bit on the Internet Research Agency, which uh, is a real thing, a, a real business that was uh, funded by an oligarch and is run out of St. Petersburg uh, in, uh, in Russia. And what we discovered in the investigation in the United States into Russian interference in the elections was that this Internet Research Agency um, was actively amplifying disinformation, putting out memes, putting out disinformation, uh, putting out bots, actually posing as different human beings with um, American flags or you know hot chicks wearing American flag bikinis and things like that, uh, hoping to get engagement from other people, hoping to amplify these conspiracy theories. The overall point of all of it, uh, of this disinformation, though, is to polarize everybody, uh, to polarize the two sides of the political spectrum, but also to sort of mess up that information uh, battle space, if you will. And so if you throw out all these different narratives, they, they, don't, they don't even have to be logical. Um, and, and in fact, when you look, they're, they're not at all logical. There's a hundred different narratives to explain a single event. And the purpose behind that is to say, to, to make the audience feel that not, the truth is not knowable. Uh, there's so many narratives out there. I don't even know what to believe anymore. I don't know what is fact anymore. And what happens with that is that people start to withdraw from public discussions. So you start no longer participating in civic debate. And the problem is that democracy, of course, is based on rule of law, it's based on civic engagement, and it's based on um, agreeing to a certain set of facts. That's what the rule of law is. We all agree what the rules are. And so these disinformation campaigns really destabilize that system and make it very difficult to have uh, reasoned civic debate. And that is very corrosive to democracies. And so in the book, Victor in Trouble, what I try to do is again, highlight, but hopefully in a fun and engaging and accessible way, um, how those narratives move through the media ecosystem and, and come to play uh, within the general public. Well, you mentioned the oligarchs. So, so again, I would like to, uh, you to elaborate. Who are these people and what is their role, for instance, in influencing, if possible, Putin's actions? So the oligarchs are a group of very wealthy people uh, around Putin. They have been allowed to make tons and tons and tons of money by looting uh, Russia, basically. And uh, in return, they have to support Putin. One of the things that they do is move their money out of Russia 
and they put it through the Western system to uh, one to park it because we have a rule of law and uh, their money is safe here. After all, look at what they managed to steal from Russia. So they would rather park it in the West where nobody else is going to steal it. Um, but they also then move, you know, you move the corruption into our own system. So they then use uh, our own capitalist system to launder their money. And in return, one of the things that Putin asks of them is to spend a certain amount of that money on what we would call strategic spending, so that the oligarchs actually become an extension of statecraft. They become tools of statecraft. Um, we know, for example, from Robert Mueller's investigation in the United States that uh, Putin had quarterly meetings with his oligarchs. So he made it very clear what his, what his priorities were, and he made it very clear that these oligarchs uh, were to spend a certain amount of money to respond to those priorities. Uh, the Internet Research Agency, for example, which I mentioned earlier, was funded by uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, who is one of those oligarchs. He also is behind the financing of the Wagner Group, which is a paramilitary group which um, has made a dent in Africa and, of course, now is, uh, is sending some people to Ukraine as well. Well, we're seeing these days or maybe months a strange sequence of oligarchs or top managers, Russian top managers, dying in mysterious circumstances. What's going on here? Are they being killed or is it just uh, an happenstance? Uh, so uh, in the world of intelligence, we, we are very skeptical of anything being a coincidence. So I'm not convinced at all that it's a coincidence. But then again, we, we just simply don't have a whole lot of information. Um, like you said, a number of oligarchs uh, or, and people maybe who aren't even sort of considered on the, the close Putin oligarch list, but uh, wealthy, powerful individuals uh, who are very high up in some of the gas companies, for example, yes, have, have turned up dead and their families have as well. And there's, there's questions, are these uh, murder suicides or uh, it certainly looks like something else is going on there, but we just don't have enough information yet. Um, but, you know, we have seen a pattern in the past of Putin uh, assassinating or attempting to assassinate people who have opposed him in, in ways. And he has done that both inside Russia and he has done that, of course, outside of Russia. Um, we've seen numerous examples, um, the Skripal case uh, in Salisbury in the United Kingdom. Um, there was a, another one in Berlin. So th th this would fit a pattern if that's what it is. But I don't think we have enough information yet. I know. I, I definitely agree. This war will leave a completely different Europe for many reasons. First of all, because Russia was supposed to be an ally of ours in many fields, will no longer be an ally of ours. And because other countries such as Finland or Sweden would join NATO. What kind of scenario should we expect from the future in your opinion? Well, I actually am looking to Ukraine as the bellwether. I think what happens in Ukraine is going to set what happens in Europe uh, on this for the, the European security paradigm for the next generation. Um, if, you know, as I said earlier that, you know, Putin really thought that his destabilization activities had, had uh, broken apart the Western alliance enough that he was going to get away with all of this. Whether or not we stay unified is in our hands. So whether Putin is right is up to us. And uh, for now we're four months into it. So maintaining unity so far has been okay, but we do already see some cracks. Uh, you know, look at the you know individual countries have a very different relationship with Russia uh, from others. Uh, Italy is one. You know, Italy has has a history of having very close both political and commercial ties with Russia, and of course Germany does as well. And so, while there is moral outrage now that the leaders of these countries are prepared to stand behind sanctions, the question is how long will that last? And if, as we discussed earlier, this does turn into a long protracted war, will that alliance and will that unity last? And um, yeah, it's up to us to, uh, to decide if what happens there. Alex, many thanks for your time and for your very precious explanations. I do recommend everybody to read your books because they're both informing and funny. So thanks again for your time. Thanks for giving us your insight. 
Thanks everybody for watching this and see you all next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.